What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thanks, Polly. Phil, come on up. Let's pray for Phil as he speaks to us this morning. Father, thank you so much for Phil. Thank you, Father, for um, all that you've been speaking to him about through this passage for this time of, of, of Holy Week. And I pray, may he know the fullness of your spirit as he speaks. And may we have ears that are willing to hear and hearts that are up for joining you, Jesus, in the adventure of following and being disciples. And we pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chris. So good morning. Good morning. My name is Philip. And it's genuinely a privilege to be able to share with you this, this morning my thoughts on this fantastic passage. This, uh, this Palm Sunday, the last Sunday in Lent. And I've read this story of Palm Sunday so many times. And as a child, I used to love getting those crosses made out of the palm reeds, you know. And I still find it marks my year when you start to see those crosses sitting on the dashboards of cars for the next two months, right? Yeah. It heralds springtime. And different churches you know, celebrate Palm Sunday in different ways. Now, I've, I've even heard of churches where they have a real-life donkey come down the aisle. And I definitely think that's something we should look at to do next year, don't you? Uh, Chris, I know you love it because, uh, you know, you love the idea of a pet service and all that kind of thing. Yes, you do. I think so. My child number three would love that. Anyway, but sometimes I think that these stories can just get a bit too sanitized, can't they? So I've been reading this book called The Last Week, and it's by Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan. And they paint a really vivid picture of what Jerusalem was like in the last week of Jesus' life. So, if you will, indulge me. Come with me on a journey. Let's take a step back in time. And picture the scene. It's Jerusalem. 2,000 years ago. The week of Passover. Your city has been under the rule of invading nations for hundreds of years. And the Romans are just the latest. But these guys are the worst. They use your own religious leaders, the Pharisees, and your temple as the means of control and domination. Your sacred building has become a place for moneylenders and thieves. It holds records of everybody's debts and is the place where they take the little money that you do have and take it in taxes from you and take it out of Jerusalem and send it to Caesar. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Jewish aristocracy, your people, all collude with the Romans to keep you under the control of Rome. And you feel resentful and rebellious. It's Passover. Visiting pilgrims have swelled the city's population from its normal 40,000 to nearly 200,000. And it's busy, and it's cramped, you're frustrated, you feel voiceless, and you're yearning for change, something, anything to liberate you from the almost, this almost despair that you're feeling. But you still remember that prophecy from Zechariah. A Messiah. One who will enter the city on a donkey and will banish war from the land commanding peace to the nations. And today, entering the city from the east, a peasant from Nazareth, one of your own kind, riding on a donkey, Jesus, who has literally just raised some guy called Lazarus from the dead. And he's talking about the kingdom of God and bringing peace to the city. Could he be the new David, the new king, to free us from oppression? 
So are you going to join the crowds? Wave palm trees and lay down your cloak to herald him and sing praises? I ask you the question because at the same time, from the west, at the other side of the city, there's another procession. Pontius Pilate, riding not on a donkey, but a great big stallion at the head of a huge column of Roman cavalry, heralding imperial power, an impressive display of force to keep the peace. Well, where have we heard that before? And show the people of Jerusalem who is really in charge. See, Pilate and the Pharisees know Jerusalem is on the edge. It's ripe for revolution. And by the end of this week, the world will never be the same again. See, that's, that's the start of Holy Week. It's edgy, unsure, dangerous. And into this political tinderbox, we have the clash of two kingdoms. The worldly kingdom of Pilate and the kingdom of heaven, promised by Jesus. And it's this clash, this tension, that's at the center of Holy Week and is at the heart of our Christian life and forces us to answer the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. And it's with this tension in mind that I'd like us to begin to look at our passage today. See, John Stott calls these verses the highest point on the Sermon on the Mount, for which it's both most admired and most resented. See, there's that conflict again between what we can see is the path that Jesus takes and the path that we want to take. See, I think these are some of the most challenging verses in the Sermon on the Mount, and I have to admit, they've forced me to think really carefully about that question. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? So let's dive in, shall we? Let's put it into context. Earlier in this chapter, in verse 17, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. See, in Jesus, there is no break between the Old Testament and the fulfillment of God's promise to his people. He's the continuation of the love story between the creator and the created. See, in these verses, Jesus asks us to look at the laws which govern our relationships with one another as set out in Exodus, Deuteronomy, and of course, Leviticus. Love Leviticus. Don't we all? Nighttime reading. Um, and you've heard these words a thousand times before. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, life for a life. They've become synonymous with exacting the full measure of revenge. I do to you what you do to me. And it fuels so much of how we interact with each other. You know, from petty road rage to cancel culture to the big stuff, you know, Gaza, Yemen, Ukraine. And the list goes on and on and on. A never-ending downward spiral of mental and physical violence. And actually, it's all just too distressing, isn't it? All too discordant. And that's because it's not what Moses meant. He was attempting to stop these cycles of violence. These laws were meant to limit punishments. But what's actually happened is, is that the Pharisees have changed the meaning to suit their agenda and express what's important to the world, not our Father. But the good news is, here's Jesus, here he comes, to draw us back to what was intended, to where our lives should be under the law of God, not man. See, Jesus is now saying 
that there is a new standard. It's not enough to be just keepers of the law. If we are to be followers of Christ, we must go beyond what the law requires. And he gives us four mini parables to make his point. The insulting and degrading backhanded slap, having our property and possessions taken from us. The invading soldier coercing our labor. Someone asking to borrow money from you. And in Luke's account, this is a beggar. And society tells us that we should hit back, defend our property, disobey orders, do the bare minimum, keep our money for ourselves, and certainly not give it to some undeserving beggar, right? But in Jesus, we have a higher standard. He says, do not resist an evil person. Don't retaliate. This is how you break the cycle of violence and make a change by not fighting back. And you don't have to look too hard in history to see where these words have had real impacts and really changed society. Gandhi, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, all inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. You see, at the heart of these words is a resolve not to stand up for your own rights, but to serve others willingly. As Mother Teresa would say, love until it hurts. And how many of us can say that we really do this? And I certainly don't. I don't. The idea of giving up our rights goes against everything that society tells us to do. Everything society tells us that is important. But it's the path that Jesus is inviting us to join him on. And it's a path that takes us all the way to Good Friday this week. You see, in each of these mini parables, Jesus is pointing to what he knows he will have to endure at Calvary. He will be mocked and struck, have the clothes taken from his back, forced to carry the symbol of Roman torture, and end up giving his life for the most undeserving of us. See, Jesus knows what is coming at the end of Holy Week, and yet he still obeys the kingdom of heaven. And so we come to the next demanding command in this passage. In verses 43 and 44, he says, You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. See, even here, the law has been changed. It's been changed from to love your enemy love your neighbor and hate your enemies. See, that's not even in the law of Moses. It's been added by the scribes and the Pharisees. The bar has been lowered to convince us that we're following the law. You know, I wonder, so I wonder how low have we actually set the bar in our culture just to make us feel better about ourselves? You know, I'm not a bad person. I leave other people alone. I love and look after my own kind. Isn't that good enough? Is it? There's a documentary on Netflix at the moment uh, about the recording of the American charitable, charity single, We Are the World. Now, you're all too young to remember this song, so, and, uh, and there's no way I'm going to sing it for you. Maybe Olivia might, you know, in, after, you, you don't know it. Oh, well, there you go. Everyone's too young. It's basically the American music industry's response to Bob Geldof's Band-Aid back in the early 1980s. And they have one chance to record this song with all the great and good of American popular music in the room, you know, from Bob Dylan to Bruce Springsteen to Willie Nelson. Every genre in American music is represented in that room. Can you imagine the creative insecurity? (sighs) And on the night of the recording, the producer, Quincy Jones, puts a sign above the recording studio door, which says, check your ego at the door. And that is what Jesus is saying here. Love those who love you and hate the rest. 
Oh, that doesn't make us righteous. It makes us no different from anyone else. As he says in verses 46 and 47, even the tax collectors and the pagans do that. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. Yeah, I'm hanging out with the tax collectors and the pagans. That's the team that I want to be in. Yeah, doing so well. But even if we feel that we can love our enemies, the second half of Jesus' command should make us check our egos at the door. As he goes on to say, and pray for those who persecute you. See, Augustine realized how hard that was, that is to do, when he said, many have learned how to offer the other cheek, but do not know how to love him by whom they were struck. Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls this the supreme command. You see, loving someone and praying for someone are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Because as Bonhoeffer goes on to say, through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. Now, I'm sure we've all got people at work or in our families or in our friendship circles who we feel are out to get us, make us feel uneasy or anxious. But ask yourself, do we truly, truly love them? Love them so much that we can stand beside them and speak for them in front of God? as Jesus did for us. Because even as he was betrayed by those who loved him, arrested, abused, beaten, ridiculed, hung on a tree, he prayed for his tormentors. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And even as we were enemies of God, undeserving of God's grace and mercy, Jesus prayed for us to be reconciled to our Father. And so we come to the final command in this passage. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> yeah! No pressure then! <laughs> now actually, I don't think he's saying that we're to be morally perfect, even if that were achievable. You know, if we look at Luke's account of this sermon, he says, be merciful even as your heavenly Father is merciful. So I think Jesus, and Jesus himself goes on to pray in the next chapter in the Lord's Prayer. You know, forgive us our debts. You see, he knows we're not going to get it right. How can we? But rather, this perfection is about showing to others the perfect love that we have received from God when we know we don't deserve it. As Adam Ramsey puts it so much more eloquently than I could ever, he says, Jesus loved you to the death before there was one molecule of love in your heart toward him. Jesus loved you to the death before you prayed one word, read one verse, and Jesus loved you to the death on your worst day. Not your best. See, it's through grace offered to each and every one of us that we can show what it's like to believe in this ridiculously generous God. So at the beginning of Lent, I actually started on a couple of devotionals, mainly because I was in bed one night and I'd left one copy downstairs and I was too lazy to go get it, so I picked up another one. So I just have them lying around the bedroom, you know. I've got hundreds of them. It's like a library. Winds Emma up, nothing, like nothing else. But what struck me about both books was that they both start with Jesus picking the 12, seeing the potential in ordinary people, not the aristocracy or the rich, but people like you and me, and saying, hey, follow me. And it's the same this morning. See, Jesus sees each one of us. He knows us and is asking us to follow him. 
Because as it says in Isaiah, the Lord called you before you were born. He named you in the womb. And in Ephesians, Paul reminds us, we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So to be a follower of Christ is to show the world the ridiculously generous love and grace that we have been given by our Father. For them we will be working out our true selves, our God-created selves. As Peter writes in his first letter in chapter 2, he says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not retaliate. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. See, for Matthew, I think the sermon is given on the mount not just because it echoes Moses receiving the law from God on Mount Sinai, but because it is the highest of ideals, the summit of Christian life, the high path which we are asked to follow all the way to Good Friday and Easter and shows us what a life could be like if we really and truly submit to the kingdom of God. So let's check our egos at the door. Because as Eugene Peterson says, this is what God does. He gives his best to everyone, regardless. This is what we must do as well. Imagine what the world would be like if we did that. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand?